Um, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Akio Tanaka from Infinity Ventures. Uh, we are early stage VC invested in greater China, including Japan. And uh, today, this morning, we have a great honor to have a guest from Taiwan, Popo Chen. He's uh, actually, he's only 27 years old, but he's a multiple entrepreneur. He's already done several companies and several exits. I think he's one of the youngest entrepreneur in, from Taiwan that actually has done uh, quite a bit at his own age. And today, he's actually joining us as the founder of Corbin Hood. Corbin Hood is uh, uh, one of the new platform for doing actually ICO itself, but also doing a crypto to crypto currency exchange. So this morning, we're going to talk cryptocurrency with uh, Popo here. And uh, Popo, welcome to Tokyo. Well, welcome to Slash. Thanks for the introduction by Akio-san. Okay. So, Popo, I just want to, I know you've done multiple startups, but actually I lost count. How many companies have you done so far? You're only uh, 27. <laughs> uh, I started my first company when I'm in college. I studied electrical engineering, and at, at the age of 20, I uh, founded an app company, and by now, I have exited three companies. So I'm sure some of the, I think, people here in the audience are also students, and it's, it's actually the right time to start your own first business. Popo did it uh, out of his own college years. But today, we're not going to talk about his college startups. We're going to talk about cryptocurrency. And uh, just to check the profile of the audience, who <laughs> in the audience actually currently own any form of crypto assets, whether it's Bitcoin, Ether, or some any other shit coin, anything is fine. Just raise your hand. <laughs> okay, and I know this guy does. <laughs> 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 okay, so some of you, including myself, it's a really tough time right now, but we are still, I think, generally speaking, optimistic in this field. And uh, today I'm gonna actually probe a little bit of Popo's brain to actually find out uh, uh, why we should be still be excited about this field and some of the. Uh, 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 interesting trends happening in the industry. But first, since we are in Japan, I think there's something we need to address. Japan is, I think, is the number one country in the world. I think it's definitely number one. This is the number one country in the world for losing a lot of crypto assets for scams and thefts. So this is a great country that has produced Mongox, and we also had a recent hiccup at uh, Cointech. And uh, I know a lot of Investors lost money, and um, uh, and it's actually it's interesting that Japan always comes out, comes out number one in terms of crypto, cryptocurrency, crimes and hacks. But uh, I just wanted to get Popo as the founder of actually exchange uh, that actually deals with cryptocurrency trading, and I wanted to actually get his perspective on some of those recent cases we have seen in Japan and elsewhere. And uh, so Popo, why is it so hard to keep cryptocurrency assets safe and why are there so many losses that we see in the real world okay so uh, let's uh, do a case study mm. so the most recent event one of the biggest set is uh, in the coin check exchange so coin check here in Japan let me review a little bit about uh, how it happened so actually, everyone can see uh, a coin check set on the newsletter. Uh, they don't actually use a cold wallet for every asset. Uh, let's, they claim why they don't use a cold wallet is because the withdrawal and deposit will be very fast. So it's an operational issue. But that's very dangerous. Uh, let me explain a little about like What's a uh, cold wallet storage? Okay, but just say, does everybody here understand the difference between cold and hot wallet? <laughs> I know people who have lost money <laughs> in CoinCheck probably know by now, but do most people here know the difference? Okay, so only a couple of people know, so you need to explain what the difference between cold and hot wallet is. Okay, so everyone has, um, uh, like many people may have a hardware wallet like uh, the Ledger, Nano S or some other hardware wallet. Let's call it a cold wallet. A cold wallet is not connected to the internet, correct? It's yes, it's completely off offline. And another way to do that is 
uh, through something we call is like a multi-signature cold wallet. It means it has a multiple cold wallet system that together forms a very strong cold wallet vault. So for example, you can see uh, we can create a new Bitcoin wallet that requires five out of eight to sign off a transaction to withdraw the funds. So in uh, operational uh, exchange, normally you will put some funds in the hard wallet that is controlled by your cloud server like Google Cloud or a AWS. And uh, like 90, over 95% should be in the cold wallet because even if someone breach your cloud system or someone that hacked your API key, they cannot steal the cold wallet. They can only got the funds in the hard wallet. So is that sounds clear? Yes. Does that sound clear? I think uh, I hope it's clear. I hope everybody <laughs> at least I don't expect hundred percent of, of you to understand, but if eighty percent of you got it, I think we can continue with the conversation. So about I think I did read a release from CoinCheck. They kept saying it's hard to do cold cold wallet. Is it hard? Uh yeah, as they said it's very hard to do the cold wallet system. But it actually is not too hard, but it will cause lots of operational costs for sure. So it's not technically hard, but it's operationally Operationally hard, hard and okay. make sure deposit and withdrawal takes longer. So user experience may be damaged, but it secures your fund. It's a trade-off. Yeah. Uh, I think, Popo, are you going to say, uh, uh, you can talk about the other uh, hack, I think, at Binance. Can you take, tell us a little bit about what happened there? Okay, so uh, like Binance is currently the world's like, top three cryptocurrency is changed in terms of volume. Uh, and, and like two weeks ago, a uh, very... Uh, uh, Binance, by the way, doesn't have a license in Japan, but they're also here in, in Japan, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, like, a uh, hack incident occurred in Binance is, uh, as they said in the newsletter, is like someone set up a phishing site, and it collected a lot of usernames and passwords on the Binance. But the system on the Binance is not hacked, actually. So actually, it's a lot of users of Binance got directed to the phishing site and lost their username and password. But why will that cause a, a huge event in Binance? Because they have a two-factor authentication, right? They have two-factor authentication. So even if a hacker got the username and password, they should not be able to log in. Binance, but there exists a like a very tricky bug in the Binance backend system. That is, when you have a, a username and password, you can directly create an API key. So that means you have already logged in, right? So <laughs> this API key doesn't require two FA. Yes. So you can basically, with a stolen username and password, have full access. Yes. So, uh, so when the hacker actually collected a lot of uh, uh, accounts that holds a lot of funds, they can actually manipulate the market. For example, I have uh, 100 million worth Bitcoin. I can, uh, I can influence any trading pair, right? And as everyone know, uh, because there are a lot of algo trading bots that will uh, do the arbitrage, across these changes. So if the hacker actually don't need to hack the funds in Binance, they just need to short or long in other exchanges and they keep spying on one pair and they, they take profit from other exchanges. They don't need to withdraw from Binance. Oh, that's very smart. So actually they're using stolen accounts to create long and short positions yes. and then actually do the trading somewhere else. Yeah, and they cash out by estimate about 200, uh, 20 million US in one day. Wow. Yeah. On other exchange, because Binance triggered the lock, lockdown on the withdrawal. 
because of it detects the anonymity of the system. So, Popo, you're running also Exchange. So can I do the same trick on your side? No. <laughs> How come? Uh, every API key you on um, who is changed, it has access control, like read only or read write, uh, read what kind of resource, like balance only or uh, place uh, order. So it actually has a full access control detail, yeah. and uh, every API key creation and revoke needs 2FA. So does everybody know 2FA, two-factor authentication? I think even if you use services like Google and Facebook nowadays, or even Apple, uh, you, it, the system will actually require you to use something beyond password. It might be SMS, or it might be uh, you know, your authenticator app, to, so that you actually have to prove, provide a second form of security in order to log on user service. I think it's actually nowadays quite common in many internet services, but it's definitely needed for some places like you know, uh, cryptocurrency or even other fintech services that actually where you're actually putting real money or assets. And it's actually surprising how many companies still don't use it. And uh, so I think if, if, if you haven't done so, please go secure your accounts. I think your, most of your social media accounts nowadays actually have 2FA. I'm sure most people here use either Facebook or Twitter. I just want to uh, check actually people's security awareness here. So who uses uh, 2FA, second factor authentication uh, security on your Facebook or Twitter accounts? Wow. Okay, so I think people. I think there are some hackers might be in the audience. Go after people who didn't raise <laughs> their hand. Their accounts are probably easily hackable. Well, okay, so this is uh, probably the level of security awareness. So I think one thing you should take away from the session, apart from what Co <laughs> what Popo has just said, I think you should go lock up your social accounts because it's one of the first places hackers will go after. <laughs> now uh, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, we have about seven minutes left. So I think one of the things I wanted to discuss with you, uh, Popo, is to talk about trend in the blockchain. I think a lot of people have been doing blockchain this, blockchain that, all kinds of the new uh, uh, systems and the platforms they're building on block on blockchain. And I know you guys are also working on some new project. And uh, can you talk about a little bit about the trend in, we see in this space? and? Uh, to the extent you can, also tell us about what you guys are working on. OK, so uh, as everyone knows, what blockchain enables us to do in the future uh, is to transform the financial landscape by uh, doing uh, enabling a trustless value transfer and smart contract execution. That means you don't need to rely on a third party authority or notary service to provide a, a secure your fund transfer because it's decentralized, secured by a consensus algorithm and the cryptography property. So instead of one uh, authority or the company controlling the transaction security, basically you have the whole community enabling it. Yeah. Decentralized. Yes. So what the problem lies in current cryptocurrencies is the one is the scalability issue. Uh, because if a uh, system is not scalable, it's not practical in the real world. Because you can see like with uh, Visa payment network, we have uh, about 4,000 per second transactions, but Ethereum only can process like 20. Bitcoin can only process a lot, about seven. And other like... Uh, 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 20 or seven in what time period? Uh, one second. One second. Per only, second. Only seven transactions. So yes. Glo if, you're, if you have a building a global financial system on that, it's too slow. Yeah, very slow. And uh, let's, we haven't talked about peak time transaction like uh, in Alibaba, like uh, Taobao, or like e-commerce system. The peak time of an event may causing like 10 times or 100 times traffic. So if a system, it cannot scale out, it is not feasible in a real world application. So, so we so, have. So, so currently, Bitcoin, Ether, those systems cannot deal with any peak time transaction of, say, typical e-commerce sites. Yes. It's too slow. 
Yeah, so uh, a lot of solutions have emerged, like, uh, like Ethereum have a sharding solution, and uh, we have uh, some Lightning Network payments network solutions, but all of these systems have other causing other new issues that we won't address into detail here. But actually, it, if you dig into that, all solution currently don't seem very promising to solve the fundamental problem. And then what are you going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> so actually... No, 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 but, but just to summarize, the issue today is that nobody is still capable of addressing high transaction needs of financial system. Yes. Yeah, so, and even that's for just value transfer. We have uh, smart contract execution, and uh, in uh, one case, it's called decentralized exchange. So everyone, uh, why everyone goes to centralized exchange? That is vulnerable to, like, uh, theft or human intervention, human error that cause a lot of problems, and the uh, system may be on the downtime, shut down, or upgrades, that cause a lot of issues for users around the globe. Well, actually, I always find that's kind of irony because people are now betting on decentralized future of Bitcoin and Ether. However, they're all betting on the decentralized future on a centralized exchange. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it's Binance or Coincheck or even Robinhood. Yeah. You guys are at this point, yes. still centralized. We right? are still centralized. Yeah. But in the future, I think when the technology advances, it will solve one is the uh, scalability issue. Another one is called the interledger issue. So it's called the interchain protocol that can uh, facilitate transactions without a third party to do an interledger transaction. So what does interledger transaction do? Uh, I think in the previous session, Ripple has demoed the interledger uh, concept, right? It's kind of like same concept, but uh, Ripple is kind of like a consortium system. So it's not uh, fully decentralized. It still needs some collateral on the interledger bridging banking system nodes. Mm. So it is still remain an unknown problem how to do a, build a fully decentralized interledger protocol. Yeah. So is that something you guys are working on right now? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we will launch our own blockchain system that is, uh, the target is to be infinite scalable, solve the fundamental issue, and uh, have a, a dedicated intellectual protocol designed to bridge old assets onto the new system. So I don't know if you're allowed to say this today on the stage, but what that's actually going to do to your own exchange? Are you going to actually make Robinhood decentralized system as opposed to the current centralized system you know like all the other exchanges in the world uh, actually any decentralized system for sure its latency will be a bit higher because it needs every participating validating nodes to reach a consensus about the finality of the transaction right so it, i think they will coexist mm. like centralized if you rely on a very high volume and low latency trading experience you go to a centralized one but if you want to be more secure and under, uh, the funds under your own control, you can go to a decentralized one. But currently, decentralized exchange are mostly not feasible because the latency is super high. And the fee is also super high. <laughs> Transaction cost is very yes. high, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have about uh, one minute left. So I think I'm going to actually ask one last question to Popo. As a, also a personal crypto investor, I wanted to pick his brain. So there are today so many investment opportunities in cryptocurrency and, and tokens. And uh, apart from your own stuff, Corbin Hood, uh, are there any uh, 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 crypto investments that you think has a, a very good long-term future? And if you can actually talk about something that uh, you think has a promise and uh, share with us, I think uh, I'll definitely appreciate it. I'll make a note of it myself as well. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, uh, Telegram is actually launching their ICO, but it's not for the public. It's like in private placement, and it has a long lockup period. But that I have read through its white paper, and technical white paper is about a 
130 pages. Yeah, Telegram, and tel Telegram. Telegram, yeah. ICO. It's called uh, Telegram Open Network, and it looks very promising. I think it's worth investing in, and uh, it actually proposes some sharding mechanism can solve partially the scalability issue. So of all the many ICOs, why do you think Telegram is promising? And you guys have nothing to do with Telegram, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, just, just to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So why do you why do you think Telegram has promise? So like I said, they solve two fundamental issues. One is scalability. Another is like heterogeneous multi-chain system. They can do cross-chain transaction, intellectual transaction on the mainnet. All right. You know, I'm just doing time check. I think we are a little bit over time, so I think I'm going to wrap up this session. So, uh, thank you very much, Popo. I think a uh, couple of takeaways from this session. If you haven't done your 2FA on your social media and other financial accounts, go home and do it right away. <laughs> and two, I think, uh, I think blockchains actually have enabled decentralized systems, but our current exchange is still centralized. I think there might be interesting, I think technical opportunities to actually enable decentralized trading in the future. I think that's definitely interesting. And personally, my main takeaway is Telegram ICO. <laughs> thank you very much, Popo, and thank, thank you everybody you. Thank for you. joining us. Thank you.